Hello, I'm Matthew of Another World Terraria. In today's vlog, I'll be covering a general update about what's going on with me, what I'm doing with my plant collection currently, a few nice accessories I got recently, a quick reveal of a couple of terrariums, including my latest work, the Brancharium, and some exciting updates and interesting info about a few species of plants. Thought a vlog would be pretty quick and easy to do compared to some of my other videos, which is important right now because as you might've heard, I'm dealing with some medical issues. I posted on the community tab and in social media and other places. So that's why I haven't been as active. Okay, here we are in the plant room, which really is only half of my collection. I got a bunch of stuff in other rooms, but this is the plant room as I have deemed it. Uh, you can see I have gone totally out of control. There's literally just crap everywhere and you know, plants all over in bins in the floor. It's totally ridiculous. Uh, I even started trying to grow some plants in open air here, you know, in pots. Uh, so anyway, what I decided I need to do is start cleaning some things up, reorganizing some stuff, improving the setups, um, getting rid of certain things, combining plants into bins when some of the bins don't have as many plants now. And so I want to kind of move them together to save space. So I'm going to be doing a lot of that as well as a lot of these bins have substrate that's really old and I shouldn't have let it go that long, but I did. So I will uh, go ahead and refresh the substrate in a lot of bins um, so that the plants will start to grow healthy again and it'll get rid of any accumulated salts or minerals, um, stuff like that from fertilizer. So I will be documenting a lot of those improvements and maintenance type things on my channel. Okay, I got the 20 gallon vertical tank um, that I converted with a frog cube conversion kit. I have a video on how that was done, so you can check that out if you're interested. Got a bunch of epiphytes in here. Recently, I moved some stuff uh, in here from other tanks as I'm reorganizing. Um, so, got a bunch of orchids. There's a really cool plant back there, which I documented in uh, my plant tour video. I think it was part one, possibly. This is an Elatostemma, uh, this one that's hanging down right there. Really, really cool genus of plants with very interesting pendant foliage. And right now it's blooming and it's got a new growth point up there. Um, so doing really good there. I'm excited about the blooms and the new growth points coming out. Also got the Reldia Minuta Flora in bloom over here. Real quick, I'll talk about the setup for the epiphytes in terms of this plastic grid back here. A lot of people in the hobby call it egg crate. I call it plastic lighting grid since that's technically what it is. Um, in any case, I cut some panels and I zip tied them together and then I just put them in here, uh, glued the pieces in here along the front edges to hold it in place and then you can just hang your epiphytic mounts by the way i have a, a video on my channel about creating epiphytic mounts as well as mounting plants on those mounts so check those out if you'd like to learn more about that and i do want to point out one other thing about this is that i the way i set this up the grid kind of is at an angle so from the front to the back it tapers in and I did that to allow space for the hooks of the epiphytic mounts to come through you can see there's one sticking out because if you put the plastic grid directly against the glass then you can't hook the plants onto it so in the back as well I left some space in between the back glass of the tank and um, you know the grid so that you can hang the plants on there and lastly I have some fans in there one of I only have one running because I just uh, needed that much ventilation right now, or air movement rather, not ventilation. So, and then I've got a little controller so I can adjust the speed. This little plant on the left of the frame in the pot there, that's a Petrocosmea, which is a plant in the Jesneriad group or Jesneriaceae family. Uh, those typically grow on cliffs and mountains and stuff like that in places like China. They grow flat and against the rock cliff faces and stuff in cracks. So that's a pretty small plant. It's got about an inch and a half diameter. This one right here is exactly the same species. And in fact, this one was grown from uh, leaf cutting. And you can see how different they look. You can see that uh, the one in the pot there is much smaller. These plants typically grow in size according to the amount of space that the roots have. So since this container is much larger than that little tiny pot, 
the plant has spread the root system out and got a lot bigger. And that is kind of an indication of what they would do in the wild. So if a plant was growing in a tiny, tiny little crack in the wall, it would stay very small and dwarfed. But this one, uh, like in the wild, if it had a crack that was bigger and there was more substrate and moisture, the plant would grow a little bit larger. So that's kind of an example of phenotypic plasticity, which means the plants adapt morphologically or in appearance, shape, form, or whatever, depending on the conditions that they encounter in their environment. Here's a Pinguicula gigantea. This one I'm pretty excited has started to grow and is finally getting a bit larger. It's perhaps three to three and a half inches in diameter now. Um, it is losing some older leaves and it's kind of not looking as good despite the new growth. Uh, so I'm going to change out the substrate to something a little bit more well-drained and kind of more mineral based. I'm thinking of using uh, maybe some lava, pumice, and maybe a little lime. I just recently got some pelletized lime and I'm going to crush that up and use it for plants that like a little bit more alkaline substrate and perhaps plants that grow in limestone environments such as this guy here as well as some of the limestone growing cliff growing uh, begonias that I have from China and so forth. Uh, when I crush that up I'm going to definitely wear a respirator and goggles and all that because lime is pretty bad you don't want to inhale that so I'm gonna do that and I'll let you know. In this filmy fern bin, I've got two Cephalomanes javonicum. People call it the Borneo fern. Uh, it used to be sold as an aquatic fern, which it's not. It's more of a, a facultative rheophyte. I think I talked about this one in part two of the collection um, tour, which by the way, I still have a lot more parts to do. So that'll be exciting. In any case, this one doing well, the one towards the front of the bin, um, you know, closest to you in the frame down at the bottom. That one was not growing as well as the one in the back uh, until recently, so now that one's taking off as well. Really cool thing about these is that I cut some of the older fronds off and I just kind of threw them on like a table and I didn't know that um, they were had viable spore, but apparently when they dried out, that triggered the spore capsules to kind of burst and there was all this spore on the table, so I swept it up and put it all on a piece of paper and let it sit another few days. And I got a bunch of Cephalomanes spore. So I threw that in some filmy fern bins on the sphagnum and I'm just gonna wait and see what happens. It would be really awesome if those grew into some sporophytes. Here's a bin which I put plants from other bins that I took cuttings of. And the reason that I used plants that I already have in this bin is because they are very rare unique species and whenever you have something that's pretty rare um, or special I would highly recommend that you make cuttings of those or divisions or whatever and put them in other bins and containers and continue to propagate those out and keep them separated and the reason why you would do that is because if for some reason a bin crashes or gets um, you know a disease or a pest or something you want to have backup plants of those rare species in other places that are not going to get infected um, by that. So whenever I have rare plants uh, or hard to get plants like this, I you know, make multiple bins or containers of that. And then not only do I have more of it, um, but then they're safe, you know, those are an insurance policy. And then you can also share those with friends and get them, you know, when they're rare, it's good to get them into the hobby more so that it can be kind of a conservation thing as well as you know, just enjoyment. Here's a pretty newly set up bin, been a few weeks, got a bunch of tissue culture plants, um, you know, aquarium plants, which can be grown immersed. So I've got flu volstratum in the bin and then there's just a bunch of stuff in here. I'm starting to really like tissue culture plants because they uh, do not have pests or disease or anything. They're totally sterile. Um, so, you know, you can just throw those into a terrarium or a wabikusa or whatever and not worry about any kind of contamination. So there's no quarantine period. Uh, I quarantine all the rest of my plants that I get, you know, when you just get plants from a trade or dealers or whatever, I always quarantine them, but it's nice with the tissue culture to not have to do that. So you can just make a new wabikusa or terrarium and not worry about um, pests or disease. Anyway, there's a lot of good stuff in here, really been growing nicely, and so I'm excited to be using those soon in a display. 
I got a water distiller here. Uh, bought a generic one off Amazon for about 120 bucks. I decided that I wanted to get my own water distiller because I was tired of buying these jugs from like Fred Meyer and lugging them around. Also, it was um, a lot of plastic waste to just have jugs all the time that I had to throw into the recycle. Um, and also recently with the coronavirus thing, there's been limits on the quantity that I can buy. And so it was kind of annoying to only be able to buy like two jugs every time I went shopping. And it's also nice to be able to get water um, whenever I need it. And it's great for emergency drinking as well. If there was, you know, something happened and the water wasn't clean to drink, you could just distill it and then it'd be good to go. So with this one, I can make about two to three gallons per day, depending on, you know, how much time I run it. It's like a gallon every four hours. I use distilled water for watering my plants and uh, terrariums and all of that good stuff because the water is pure and there's no minerals or any kind of chemicals in it. Um, that's good for sensitive plants and also when you're using it to water terrariums and things like that, uh, the distilled water, because there's no minerals and things in it and salt, it doesn't leave a residue on the glass like tap water sometimes does and it doesn't build up in the substrate. Um, so it keeps your glass clean and it's good for you know sensitive plants, orchids, bryophytes, um, s small tropical plants and all that so that's why I use it and I got this distiller and now I'm good to go. Please disregard the catastrophic mess behind this object and just pay attention to the object. This is a fogger that I got just recently and I'm stoked because I've never had a fogger before. I've always wanted one. Uh, this one was not too expensive and it works great. This was uh, from Amazon. I'll put a link in the description. Anyway, I used this one to create fog in my branch terrarium, also known as the Brancharium tank, for the photo that I posted recently. So you can check out that pic right here and I'm pretty stoked to reveal that terrarium as well. Here is the Brancharium. I'm just gonna do a quick run through here. I'm gonna pass by with the camera. There's a little fan in there, 60 millimeter by 10 millimeter, and that's just for airflow, um, which improves the um, conditions for orchids and a lot of other epiphytic plants, as well as helps reduce mold. I'm probably gonna wire up a second fan and have it on the left side so that they can both blow across and really get that going. That fan is on a timer. It goes on and off like seven times a day for about uh, 20 to 30 minutes each time. And it's good to do that because then the plants have a chance to um, you know, rest and kind of reabsorb humidity and stuff like that so they're not constantly drying out. Here's a little terrarium in an Exoterra Nano. It's eight inch by 12 inch. I um, have had this one a long time and it's gone through multiple different designs. This is the most recent one, which I have not shown. Um, it has a stump there and then I took some like spiderwood roots and kind of stuck them in there to look like part of the stump. It's got a sloping background, which slopes toward the back as you can kind of see. And I made the background out of red clay and peat moss. And I think I mixed a variety of other things in there. Um, and so that was an experiment and as you can see it's doing really well it looks pretty awesome and the moss is just loving it it's really spreading over um, so that one's pretty cool i don't have anything else in it yet as far as plants just a bunch of different mosses that have kind of naturally grown in but i might stick some other plants in there if i can think of something that would look good um, and grow you know well in the available substrates as well as that would be small enough to keep the correct scale in terms of the size of the tank. If you haven't already, join Team Terraria now by hitting the subscribe button and make sure you ring the bell so you don't miss any new videos. Now go check out the video description or info cards for links to all the videos that I mentioned in this vlog.